may be seated. I wanted to share just a, a bit of introduction as a part of uh, why we're doing this. Um, throughout uh, probably the last year, I've had several folks in uh, the different services to say, well, why don't we sing this, or why don't we sing that, or why don't we sing more? So today, that's what we're going to do. Uh, there are some of those that uh, you'll hear uh, hymn stories, a part of it, uh, that will be a part of uh, a witness to you. And in a moment, you're going to hear instructions for singing, which uh, uh, Wesley was uh, very sure of that folks uh, understood that because early on, Methodists were known as singing Methodists, but they were also known as shouting Methodists. So today is our singing Methodist Sunday, and we have scheduled the shouting Methodist Sunday a few weeks down the road. Uh, we also have talked to EMT, and we'll have an ambulance uh, on call uh, if we do that. No, just kidding. <coughs> Part of the great uh, hymns of the church and many songs uh, are attributed to someone who was known well by the name of Charles Wesley. I wanted to share just a couple of words uh, about his life. Even though he wrote more than 8,900 hymns in his life, Charles Wesley never heard them sung on Sunday morning. Charles was an Anglican minister as a part of that, and but did not split from the Church of England until after his death. But the Anglican Church did not allow new hymns in the service until the 1820s. Charles did hear his music sung at midweek gathering. His prolific clear, he averaged 10 lines of verse a day for 56 years. Not only did he write, he wrote enduring hymns. In fact, Methodist hymnals today contain almost 150 of his works. One reason is that his family was musical. His father wrote hymns. All three sons wrote them. Charles had a natural talent of verse and put it to use to glorify God. Also important as a Christian hymn writer, Charles had his mind steeped in scripture. While at Westminster, he studied, uh, started memorizing the New Testament in Greek. God's word was so ingrained in Charles that it had to come out. Another reason, perhaps, is that Charles wrote the Christian experience, forgiveness. If Charles Day, few non-Christians heard the preachers. All sermons were done in church, and they just didn't attend. Charles had a heart for outreach and wrote, emotional hymns with invitation stanzas. Charles wrote, John gave the directions for singing. But a part of that is that Charles, in so many of them, and you might say, well, where's the scripture? We've got some, but the hymns are full of scripture. And Charles also included, along with John, important theology, theology that helps us know God better. I hope your favorite's there. If it's not, let us know. And we'll try to do it. We picked out several as a part of that. But you need to hear the instructions for singing first. Learn these tunes before you learn any others. Afterwards, learn as many as you please. Sing them exactly as they are printed here, without altering or mending them at all. And if you have learned them, to sing them otherwise, unlearn it as soon as you can. Sing all. See that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. Let not slightest degree of weakness or weariness hinder you. If it is a cross to you, take it up, and you will find it a blessing. Sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift your voices with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of it be heard than when you sing the songs of Satan. Sing modestly. Do not bawl, as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation, that you may not destroy the harmony but strive to unite your voices together so as to make one clear, melodious sound. Sing in time. Whatever time is sung, be sure to keep with it. Do not run before nor stay behind it, but attend close to the leading voices and move therewith as exactly as you can and take care not to sing too slow. This drawing may naturally steal on all who are lazy. And it is high time to drive it out from us and sing all our tunes just as quick as we did at first. And the last one, number seven, 
Above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing him more than yourself or any other creature. In order to do this, attend strictly to the sense of what you sing and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound, but offered to God continually. So shall your singing be such as the Lord will approve here and reward you when he cometh in the clouds of heaven. Psalm 95, 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. If you sing loud enough, you don't have to stand on this part. But if you get low, we will stand through all of them. Okay? Boberg, a 26-year-old Swedish minister, wrote a poem in, in 1885, which he called, O Stor Gud, O Mighty God. The words literally translated to English said, When I the world consider, which thou hast made by thy mighty hand, and how the web of life thy wisdom guideth, and all creation feedeth at thy board. Then doth my soul burst forth in song of praise. O oh, great God, O oh, great God. His poem was published and forgotten, or so he thought. Several years later, Carl was surprised to hear it being sung to the tune of an old Swedish melody. But the poem and hymn did not achieve widespread fame. Hearing this hymn in Russia, English missionary Stuart Hine was so moved that he modified and expanded the words and made his own arrangement of the Swedish melody. He later said his first three verses were inspired, line upon line, by Russia's rugged Carpathian mountains. The first verse was composed when he was caught in a thunderstorm in a Carpathian village. The second, as he heard the birds sing near the Romanian border and the third as he witnessed many of the Carpathian mountain dwellers coming to Christ. The final verse was written after Dr. Hine returned to Great Britain. Sometime later, Dr. J. Edwin Orr heard How Great Thou Art, being sung by Naga tribespeople in Assam, in India, and decided to bring it back to America for his use in his own meetings. When he introduced it at a conference in California, it came to the attention of music publisher Tim Spencer, 
who contacted Mr. Hyde and had the song copyrighted. It was published and recorded. During the 1954 Billy Graham Crusade in Haringey Arena, George Beverly Shea was given a leaflet containing this hymn. He sang it to himself and shared it with other members of the Graham team. Though not used in London, it was introduced the following year to audiences in Toronto. In the New York Crusade of 1957, it was sung by Bev Shea 99 times with the choir joining the majestic refrain. Would you please stand and join us singing all of the verses of How Great Thou Art, number 77. my soul, my Savior, God, 
Psalm 68, 32 through 35. O kingdoms of earth, sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord. Stealth to him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. Behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. So I cherish the old rugged, old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged, old rugged cross and exchange it someday. to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he coming. They're going to help sing a song too. As they come forward, I was going to say one of the very first songs I learned to sing when I was your age was a song called Jesus Loves Me. And once upon a time, almost every child in a church might know that song. I'm not so sure we all do right now. God bless you. So this song that I love to sing and teach to children was didn't start out as a song. It started out as a poem. There were two sisters by the name of Anna and Susan Warner. They lived on Constitution Island, just across the Hudson River, from West Point Military Academy. And from the time that they were 13, that Anna was 13 and Susan was 16, 
they had to write stories and poems and novels to help keep a roof over their head because they needed the money. <coughs> but in 1860, they wrote a book called Say and Seal, S-E-A-L. And there is a page on there about a child who is very sick. And his school teacher reads him a poem. And Anna Warner wrote that poem, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And it great gave so much comfort to a lot of people because it's really what you believe to set to music. And that's what William Bradbury did. In 1862, he read that poem and he was so moved by it, he wrote the music for it. <coughs> and even though the Warner's books are no longer in print and nobody remembers them, this song, because it was published by Mr. Bradbury's music company, became known around the world. And Susan and Anna taught cadets at West Point this song. They taught them Sunday school classes. Dwight Eisenhower was one of the last cadets to come to their class before Anna died. But do you know what else was taught around the world, Lucy, and not just the United States? There's a story that John F. Kennedy told about being his PT-109 boat in 1943 was rammed and sunk around the Solomon Islands. Two of the natives rescued them, and as they were riding on the PT boat to pick up the survivors, the Marines started singing, Jesus loves me, and the islanders joined in, and together they sang that great hymn about how much Jesus loves us. Kennedy kept a coconut on his desk in his office as a reminder of that incident and said that his favorite hymn was Jesus Loves Me. So can you help me sing that now, Miss Tracy? Are you going to come help us sing? All right. We're going to sing from up here, and if you all will join with us, that's wonderful. Just the first, the main verse in the yeah. chorus. Can you help me? All right. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Let's have a quick prayer. Dear Jesus, I would do pray that as our children learn words, can read the Bible, I pray that they will also learn the great songs and hymns of our faith, the praise songs that help us express our love and devotion to you. In your name I pray. Amen. When the great Chicago fire consumed the Windy City in 1871, Horatio G. Spafford, an attorney heavily invested in real estate, lost a fortune. About that time, his only son, age four, succumbed to scarlet fever, and Horatio drowned his grief in work, pouring himself into rebuilding the city and assisting the 100,000 who had been left homeless. In November of 1873, he decided to take his wife and daughters to Europe. Horatio was close to D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey, and he wanted to visit their evangelistic meetings in England and then enjoy a vacation. When an urgent matter detained Horatio in New York, he decided to send his wife, Anna, and their four daughters, Maggie, Tanetta, Annie, and Bessie, on ahead. As he saw them settled into a cabin aboard the luxurious French liner Villa de Hurave, an unease filled his mind and he moved them to a room closer to the bow of the ship. Then he said goodbye, promising to join them soon. During the small hours of November 22, 1873, as the Villa de Hurave glided over smooth seas, the passengers were jolted from their bunks. The ship had collided with an iron sailing vessel, and water poured in like Niagara. The Villa de Hurave tilted dangerously, screams, prayers, and oaths merged into a nightmare of unmeasured terror. Passengers clung to posts, tumbled through the darkness, and were swept away by powerful currents of icy ocean. 
loved ones fell from each other's grasp and disappeared into foaming blackness. Within two hours, the mighty ship vanished beneath the waters. The 226 fatalities included Maggie, Tanetta, Annie, and Bessie. Mrs. Spafford was found nearly unconscious, clinging to a piece of the wreckage. When the 47 survivors landed in Cardiff, Wales, she cabled her husband, saved alone. Horatio immediately booked passage to join his wife. En route, on a cold December night, the captain called him aside and said, I believe we are now passing over the place where the Villa de Hurov went down. Spafford went to his cabin, but found it hard to sleep. He said to himself, It is well, the will of God be done. He later wrote this famous hymn based on those words.
Dr. Eugene Peterson has made the observation, which is re reflected in many of our hymns and choruses today, that the measurement of a church's impact is going to be first seen in the giving of its members. Let's bow our head for prayer as we dedicate this offering. Father, we thank you for your presence here today, and we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and your involvement in our lives. And so we dedicate these gifts now to be used in the ministry of this church, and we offer them in Christ's name. Amen. jealous for me, loves like a hurricane, I am a tree, bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy, when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. And he is our prize, drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. So heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way he loves us. Before we pray this morning, I know what you're thinking, and I'm looking, and we had a whole lot more than what we're going to get done, so we're going to do a favorite hymn sing part two, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll finish at that point in just a moment, but reminder for all of us, some of those hymns are hymns that maybe you, are praise choruses, contemporary songs have spoken to your heart at some time. I know when I sit and think, I wish... 
I were able to pin words that would, uh, would speak as these have spoken to me this morning and those that have become favorites over the years. But somewhere, at some time, music speaks to our heart. Part of it is because that's a part of the brain that we need to connect with. And it helps us sense the power and presence of God. As we share in prayer this morning, I want to share the prayer. And then, so that uh, you can get to Sunday school or out, we're going to sing, I'll Fly Away. Is that appropriate? Okay. All right. Let's pray. Gracious God, we bow in your presence this morning and we sense and know that you have been here among us. The scripture that's gone forth is more than probably what a, a sermon could be. We know that it is life. And we're called to share those words within our heart that we might know your power and might know your presence. So, Father, for the music that's been offered up to you in praise and thanksgiving, we give thanks for those who, who sensed in their heart by the prompting of your spirit these words that have come to us through the years and even those of recent days. And we just ask that you would fill us anew and afresh with your love and with your grace. Father, we worship you and we know that you inhabit the praises of your people. As we've shared here this morning, we pray that and know that you have been here among us and we know that you'll be with us as we go forth in a few moments. But we also know that you're intimately concerned about our each and every need. So the needs that we have upon our hearts and our lives this day, you know them better than anyone else. Lord, would you meet those needs? Even for those who are unable to be here today, those in the hospitals, those at home, those in the nursing homes, those who are traveling, you know their needs as well. You're the God of health and strength and wholeness, and we know that you're a God of healing. We know that you're a God that takes confusion and makes it orderly. We know that you do mighty and wonderful deeds. We are here to testify to that this morning, that great is our God. Lord, would you hear our prayer this morning? And would you take even those words that are not spoken, but remain in our hearts and in our minds, and let them be offered to you, asking again for your good and perfect will to be made known and to be done. Hear our prayer as we offer it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. And uh, if any of you decide you want to fly away, just go ahead. That's the song we're going to sing. Uh, I don't know if we got the words or not. Well, if, uh, if not, listen to somebody who's close by because I'll guarantee you a lot of you already know this, okay? And you sing well or we will go on another 30 minutes. All right. <laughs> Oh, 
you can walk as you leave, but don't run. Okay? Take this as a blessing, not necessarily a benediction. May the life that is in Jesus Christ, the life that is made known to us this day in song, may it place a song in our heart and a spring in our step that we might glorify God in all that we do. May you go with his blessing. Amen.